Um, I followed this this congress uh, since yesterday evening, and I have to say the the chat is pretty lively. So um, you're very welcome to use the in meeting chat for for discussions and comments. But please use the Q and A function for for your questions. And if possible, please also specify to whom you direct your question. So um, it's better not to use the chat, but really the Q&A for, for your questions. A uh, few words on data protection. I, I think I maybe have to say this. Um, you all know that this is streamed uh, as a live stream on YouTube. So um, just be aware of uh, that, it's, that your uh, comments will also be online later um, on the web page of the Congress. So um, when I prepared the forum, I, um, I thought about um, power structures a lot um, because what I learned when I worked with um, all the people in the financing for development world, uh, one thing they taught me very early is follow the money. And um, I want to start with two observations before we go into the discussion. One is that um, apparently development cooperation does not really reach the extreme poor. Uh, we have a situation where the richest 11% of the world population holds more than 80% of the wealth. Um, and Credit Suisse uh, during the pandemic also published a report where they said um, global household wealth has held up extremely well during the pandemic. And um, we also see this uh, when we look at the financial markets. We also do have growing pockets of poverty. That's how it's called. And um, yes, the implementation of the SDGs require changes in fiscal policy. But um, maybe to end extreme poverty, and I quote a, a good colleague of mine, uh, Kate Donald, whom we also co-published the spotlight report on the um, sustainable development. She said to end extreme poverty, we must also end extreme wealth. So maybe there should be an additional goal, um, not only end extreme poverty, but also end extreme wealth. And the second observation would be that, uh, that the development aid system probably suffers, suffers from a legitimacy crisis. Uh, we do see many trends in financing such as um, increased private finance, what we call the private turn and development. And this did not really promote quality development as we imagined. Um, so I want to discuss in this forum, what should really happen? Um, what do we need to, to challenge power structures that are responsible for the status quo and that we also increasingly see when we look at the post-COVID um, agendas and the recovery programs. So exactly how and um, who will now follow the money, so to say, um, together with me? I have three guests here. Um, one is, the first one is Jennifer Del Rosario Malonzo. She's uh, the executive director of IBON. That's a southern NGO that engages in people's rights and democracy around the world. And she works on aid and development finance and finance issues. And that's also how we met. Ivan also hosts the global secretariat of, um, of the platform Reality of Aid and also the CSO Partnership for Development Effectiveness. Uh, I also have Barbara Adams with me. She's the president of the Global Policy Forum and a part-time professor at the New School University. She's an economist and her expertise um, has very many facets. Um, she's a CSO policy advocate and she has been working with the United Nations for a very long time. She um, focuses on justice and multilateralism and governance and sustainability. And this is also how we met because um, she's one of the co-authors of the sustainable of the spotlight report on sustainable development that I already mentioned. And then um, finally, I have Jason Rosario Brianza with me. Um, he is an economist too, who works on trade and tax and illicit financial flows on domestic resource mobilization. So all um, matters actually covered by the financing for development process. And he's uh, also the executive director at the African Forum on 
and Network on Debt and Development Afrodat. So um, I wanted to introduce you first because I thought it's it's maybe nicer since people see all your videos already and um, I start with the questions now. So my first question to Jennifer to start with would be, um, you were the coordinator of the Global Secretariat of the Reality of Aid Network until 2015. I know this is, um, this is a while ago and things changed a lot since then and we do have a global pandemic now. But um, maybe to start with, what is the reality of aid in 2021, in your opinion? Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And um, good evening from the Philippines to everyone, to my uh, co-panelists, um, Jason and Barbara. Um, so what is the reality of aid? Um, well, definitely troubling. <laughs> there is still much to do uh, and to be desired, both in terms of quantity and quality. So it means more work for us to do. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, aid flows, even before the pandemic, it was already very endemic. Um, and so with the pandemic and the crisis now, it has been really more unpredictable. Um, so uh, looking at, you know, over half a century of the promise to commit um, aid worth 0.7% of GNI or the gross national income of uh, developed countries, donor states as a group have never really delivered on this target. And um, about only four or five no, um, have met this target over the years. Um, so for... Um, for the, some figures, now let me just uh, bring up some uh, figures from the Reality of Aid Report, which is uh, upcoming um, within the year. Um, and I had the privilege of uh, getting some preview of the <laughs> report that we are coming up with. Um, they said that um, the 2019 ODA is at 152.8 billion US dollars, which is actually a decline by 2.3 percent since um, 2016. Now, that's the the uh, uh, full figure. But if you um, subtract or remove, you know, those amounts that that don't actually leave, you know, the donor countries such as indoor uh, in donor refugee costs debt relief, uh, interest payments. Um, the real ODA or real aid is actually much lower at $135 billion, so, um, which is about only 0.28% of the total OECD DAC GNI. So really aid quantities in 2020 and beyond would be really uh, be uncertain. And um, we we feel that um, it would it would still be uh, defined by the donor priorities uh, amid the pandemic and uh, the multiple crisis that we are in. Um, and uh, a recent research um, just released this February by Development Initiatives uh, already says that there is a projected decline. Um, so bilateral donors have actually decreased their aid commitments by about 36% between 2019 and 2020. And so that's the, that's the whole um, aid figures at the moment. Now, um, in terms of the political significance of um, aid, it has always been um, having this dual character, right? Um, so it is a public resource that is mandated to address poverty and inequalities. And it is actually um, a historical responsibility of the global north to the global south. Um, you can view that whether from the standpoint of, um, you know, the centuries of exploitation and plunder that has been um, done through uh, neocolonial and colonial relations. Um, or even if you just look at it as a, as a, a, a international solidarity, you know? so that's one character of aid. And um, a 
at the same time, we also are very much aware <laughs> that aid has always been political and that, you know, aid relationships has always been reflective, um, as I think um, pointed out by this conference itself. Um, it's been always reflective of the international um, political and economic inequalities or asymmetries that exist today. So, um, yes, uh, definitely aid has been um, always been a part of the tools um, to forward foreign policy and commercial interests of uh, donor countries, along with diplomacy and military strategy. So um, I think uh, I, I should stop here <laughs> and uh, yeah, look forward to our uh, further discussion. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Um, it's actually a very good, uh, it links up very good to Barbara's uh, work, I would say, um, because Barbara, I picked, I mean, you publish extensively and it's really uh, actually hard to follow <laughs> your new publications. I picked out one uh, quote that I found very interesting. Um, you once wrote that the term partnership in the UN sphere is a misleading term. Um, maybe you could, I mean, Jennifer now said that, that it's about power relations also in, in the aid system. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a bit more on this and, and also link it to maybe inequality, uh, power relations uh, and uh, financing for development. Again, uh, in, a, in a broader sense that I think Jason will also speak, speak about later then. Thanks, Barbara. Thank you, uh, and greetings, everyone, from a very snowing morning. Um, I'm getting an echo. Anybody else? No. Then I shall carry on and use the voices. Um, it's very important to mention partnership. So I think the first people are great. People have really thought we have really over challenge. There's so much um, And this is now open enough to get all hands on deck. Um, and the contribution come from society. And I'm going to use this time that I raise concerns. Um, the first uh, yeah. Uh, Barbara, just a bit, uh, because the sound is a bit bad, you um, switched off the video already now, I saw. Maybe it's better if we work without the video in that case. Um, I did that. Yeah, no, I, I don't know why. I'm just looking around to see if there are any buttons I can press. We could also use the audio in, in, in that case um, and switch to Jason quickly. If that's, that's fine. Yeah? That's fine by me. Okay, so uh, let's work with the audio then. Uh, I think it's maybe easier. Um, I think you should have a number to call in that case. Okay. Or, or, use, the, or use the phone in some cases it's also um, it doesn't need so much data if you use the link with the phone okay um, so I quickly switch to to Jason I mean I managed uh, managed mentioned the uh, financing for development uh, agenda already and you are the executive director at Afrodat so Maybe you can give us a little introduction on what's that got to do with the development. Uh, Jennifer went into the ODA numbers already, and that is the other part of the financing for development agenda. And um, I believe that many groups have always been pushing for that relief. Uh, so maybe you can go into more detail. Thanks, Jason. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be uh, on this very amazing panel with Jennifer and Barbara. And congratulations, first of all, to the organizers for this three-day event. Um, 
It's, it's interesting. The When we talk about financing for development, yeah, we can't ignore debt um, with regards to how the entire financial composition of a country's uh, resource portfolio um, presents itself and makes itself available for um, investment in, in different development projects, whether these are, you know, infrastructure, health, um, social um, and productive sector um, projects. Um, the, the interesting thing, um, which I want to pick up in terms of what Jennifer has mentioned, and I'm sure Barbara will touch on this when she, when she joins us, is the evolution of how the financing pie, if you if you look at it that way, has changed. Um, and, and to just narrow down very specifically, um, a huge component now is, in terms of, all, of, of the debt makeup, has really been driven by um, this development narrative that includes things like mega infrastructure investments. So, you know, if you uh, you just need to move around in some of the major cities um, in Africa and everywhere you see that, you know, there are these big mega road infrastructure projects that are being um, constructed and being implemented. Many of these are uh, being financed through debt. Some of it is concessional. A lot of it is non-concessional. Um, a lot of it is then also borrowed from uh, um, from from commercial uh, sectors at very uh, uh, commercial rates, which which then puts added pressure on on the uh, revenue or the budget book of, of developing countries. So it, there is this debt component that is um, that has evolved over time and has become very now with the pandemic. Um, it's been accelerated, and the the dangers and, and of, of you know following this sort of narrative and this trajectory of this mega infrastructure development um, ideology or philosophy um, is is really um, creating challenges. I think the second point with with regard to what Jennifer said in terms of the the aid and the ODA specifically is also within ODA, which is a very narrow component of financing. Its composition itself has changed. Um, we're seeing increasingly. Um, a declining role of bilateral donors, for example, in, in some of these bigger uh, productive sectors and still having a major influence in the social sectors. But we're also seeing the composition of their ODA is, is declining from grants and moving more towards loans. Um, and, and, a, and a third component is that the IFIs, so the international financial institutions, are also beginning to have a greater proportion of the loan component of ODA. And, and so when we talk about debt in, in this sense, um, it's important to realize that, that there is a, a increasingly and worryingly um, debt component within the ODA architecture. Um, and a, a lot of this is being driven by what we call the capture of the corporate sector within the financing for development agenda, this commercialization or privatization of, of development because, you know, some may refer to the, the political um, economy of ODA in, in Europe and in, in, in North America um, over the past 15 years. Um, you know, some may refer to the, the, the lack or the declining um, apathy for ODA because of, of um, internal issues resulting from the global financial crisis, for example. Um, or you may even see that, you know, they... Um, People questioning further, you know, the impact of what um, what impact is ODA actually having um, in the sense of um, uh, uh, impact on in the countries where it's being invested. Um, so there's a huge uh, conversation to be had when we talk about the role of debt and what has debt got to do with um, with this conversation and how it then further exacerbates or further worsens the indebted situation that many African countries and developing countries, more broadly speaking, are going to be facing uh, as a result of the crisis. Um, and I should caution here as well is to say, you know, not everything is being blamed or being blanketed under the COVID-19 pandemic crisis. But what we're saying is the crisis has illuminated and, and really shone, shone a very bright light on some of the 
fractures and the and the brokenness of the of the different architectures um, that we both that we all represent um, in 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 our different works of life. So there's the financial architecture, the debt architecture, the trade architecture. Um, now we're talking about the health financing architecture with regards to vaccines and and the vaccine wars that are currently taking place. Uh, you know, in in terms of ensuring developing countries get access. So. Within that, the ODA, the role of ODA and the discussion of um, the role of ODA within uh, the financing agenda and the broader development agenda, you know, really needs to take a, a significant look at itself and, and, and see, as, as Jennifer has mentioned, whether the, the power relations are the same as they were, you know, 30, 40 years ago, because we also have the emergence of new uh, donors, right, um, who also have a very different way to working, <laughs> you know, the, uh, compared to the rest of us. So we, we need to sort of take that into account. And I think that's a, a very nice and important aspect when we talk about, um, and I'm very interested to hear Barbara's response on this idea of partnership as well, um, and, and within the UN system, because I know, you know, Jennifer, like myself at Afrodad, we, we really believe very much in the UN system. And, and you know, it's a, it's a critical uh, area for where you know um, every country has a voice and has a single vote and one that counts in, in terms of getting things moving, but also if there is going to be a genuine reclaiming back of the space by by states um, in this way and citizens by extension in in, in this conversation. Thank you, Jason. These are very, very crucial questions, I believe. I mean, the role of the state, uh, the role of finance. Uh, we'll get back to this. Um, I hope that Barbara is with us now. I am. You are. Okay, perfect. Um, so we try again. I'm sorry, Barbara. That's okay. But the but I'm not sure this is it? It seemed, I turned the thing off and started again. Is it okay? It's a bit, um, well, there's some delay <laughs> in, the, in the connection, I believe. Um, not the best one from New York today. <laughs> um, yes, it's time to the test um or maybe uh are you are you um did you check in with the phone now i have the do you want to try getting i think it's easier maybe um with the call maybe they can give you the the numbers um or if you if you click on the link with the phone um because the phone doesn't eat up so much data. I believe it's maybe better. Okay. Well, sorry, I think I quickly jump back to um, or first explain one thing <laughs> that came up in the chat already. That's uh, what's ODA. That's actually the official development assistance. Sorry that we never really explained it. Um, I believe it's <laughs> also due to the fact that this financing for development community is very much in, like uses, I don't know, slogans all the time and abbreviations. I mean, I had the same problems when I uh, when I joined it, actually, <laughs> um, that they come up with so many abbreviations. Um, so let me quickly jump to the to the next question. Um, I think uh, that I mean, we touched so many um, policy areas already. It's a, it's a bit hard to to really um, focus on the on the COVID fiscal implications and the implications for ODA maybe and um, how global economy needs to change. Um, I mean, there's so many various aspect, um, aspects in it. I I think um, one thing that's interesting was mentioned by Jason. Now um, I think we we really entered the ODI called it once the age of choice. So there's a lot of choice for developing countries now um, in terms of finance, which is actually, if you look at it, 
in the first place, a good thing. I mean, they're not so much dependent on, on one donor um, anymore. On the other hand, Jason, you mentioned the, the greater role of the um, IFIs, of the international finance institutions. Um, maybe um, I don't want to go into too much detail on, on certain lenders, but um, maybe we can just quickly jump to the question of the private creditors, because I believe it's very fundamental here. And Jason, if you can go a bit more into detail on the private creditor question, and then I jump back to Jennifer and we see whether we can get Barbara into the discussion again. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And I think this is a very, uh, very important part of, of the conversation when we're looking at um, the different financing options that are available to developing country governments. Um, correctly so, when, when you do have this age of choice, it's, it's in one way an indicator that countries are growing, they are developing, and, and therefore, you know, even though we have these arbitrary categories that are set up by the Bretton Woods institutions, you know, the low income, middle income, and so on, but as, you know, as we move across these different um, income groupings, your on the one hand, your choice uh, for things like uh, concessional financing reduces, but your, your options for non-concessional financing increases. So, um, you know, if I was to relate it to, let's say, just uh, a, a citizen, you know, when you when you're 18, your credit is really bad, and you you know you you're hardly going to get anything. But when you're 40 and you're earning a certain type of income, your credit rating sort of goes up all of a sudden, and every bank wants to give you a credit card and tell you to spend on any on everything and anything with 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 different types of interest rates. Um, and this is exactly what many developing countries um, in Latin America, in, in, in Asia, in Africa, some in Africa have, have experienced, where as they've moved from being uh, low income to low middle income or from low middle income to middle income, um, their ability to access concessional lending or concessional finance from institutions like the World Bank has, has declined, but their access or their choice many of options from the, the non-concessional side has, has actually gone up. Um, um, and so this is where the issue uh, of the, the private creditors come in and, you know, the pro proliferation of different types of financial instruments um, with different types, types of terms and conditions, often very stringent and very strict terms and conditions, um, you know, in terms of what happens if you don't pay, but actually accessing the finance might be very easy, but adhering to the repayment conditions is what becomes very difficult um, and becomes a challenge. And we're beginning to witness this quite a bit here in Africa. Um, several countries that have, you know, sort of moved from being in, from moderate debt risk or debt distress to being in debt distress, um, countries like Zambia, for example. Um, recently, we've seen countries like Chad, Ethiopia, Kenya, who are looking to enjoin um, the G20, the Group of 20 um, initiative on, on debt restructuring and debt relief. So this is what it means uh, when we talk about uh, private creditors, is that, you know, their business by their very nature of being called private is to maximize on the finance that they are providing um, to developing countries. And they, you know, they use every trick in the book to ensure that they maximize that return, that, that interest return uh, on the principal, principal amounts. Um, and this has become a big challenge, particularly when um, countries that are commodity dependent or resource dependent and really rely on the tax revenues to come from those sources, um, when there's a collapse or a dip in commodity prices at the global level, then those revenues are affected and the ability to pay then becomes a bit of a challenge. And you start seeing um, countries going into stress um, because of um, those challenges. And then, of course, you know, we have um, um, non-traditional lenders as well who um, appear to be bilateral lenders, but in part, there's a big chunk of that that, that tends to be um, uh, driven from the back end as private lending, but through a state-driven vehicle. Um, so I think that's also quite um, important. And uh, when, when looking at how these are being negotiated, the safeguarding mechanisms for developing countries aren't necessarily there. And that's why many of us in the financing for development movement um, are now calling for a rethink of how this global debt 
architecture actually should be governed. Um, the proliferation, Elizabeth, as you've mentioned, un under the age of choice, whilst it's a good thing, I think what has what has missed the boat, and unfortunately the lessons from the financial crisis were not learned, is an architecture to govern what the age of choice actually means. When you have such a broad proliferation of actors and players, who, who should be the ones responsible for holding them to account, especially when you when you don't have the infrastructure or the policy framework, particularly at the national level, to fully enforce this. So I think that's where I'd say, you know, the role of the private creditors has come in and has become a very um, difficult uh, set of state uh, groupings to, to negotiate with. And, you know, the current insistence of them, of them not being on the table to discuss with us is actually having this uh, negative impact on, on the ability to then reach out and, and have a proper conversation on debt relief and debt restructuring. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, I want to get back to you, to, to this other part. I mean, um, debt relief is one, one thing that uh, civil society organizations lobby very hard for here. Um, the other thing is increase ODI um, so that we reach a 0.7 target. Um, actually, it's it's very confusing if you read about like the, all the criticism also um, about aid as such. Um, they, they have there have been quite some memoranda here in Germany, for example, calling for an end to aid. They said we rather need um, better trade. And I mean, you know the discussion. So um, you said the, the decline in aid is actually worrying. And, and I fear that also private giving, of course, will decrease a lot uh, due to the global recession we are facing um maybe you can go a bit more into detail about like what's what's really what how should oda then look like thanks elizabeth and also to um uh respond also to what uh, jason has been raising about uh, increasing um dependence on debt of uh, uh many developing countries so um i would just point out that um, many developing countries, many southern countries, um, have been shaped to be dependent on foreign capital. So, um, and this is because of the decades of neoliberal policies such as um, liberalization, privatization, deregulation. So, um, in a sense, you know, um, developing countries were deprived of the so-called development ladder or the, the, the measures um, that uh, developed countries had the option to use before, such as uh, state control and regulation, um, subsidies, um, and, and protection of their national economies. But this has all been decimated uh, in, in the decades of neoliberalism. And so... Um, Together with this, um, with the South being prevented from utilizing um, domestic economic and financing policy tools, um, they have also been um, shaped to be increasingly dependent uh, on whether on aid, on debt, or on foreign um, private investment. And all these have been at the expense of, um, you know, um, neglecting their domestic economies, um, neglecting their uh, their rural uh, development, and ensuring the um, industrialization of their own um, uh, economies. So it it, it thus becomes um, a vicious cycle because they the the, the economies have been um, so made so much dependent, and and now. Um, the narrative is that um, these countries need more uh, loans and more <laughs> investment so that they can be um, exploited further by capital, right? So I think um, if we if we are to address um, <laughs> the the problems that we have at the moment, um, we have to also look at all these um, interconnected um, problems uh, in the economy, in the financing system, 
in in the uh, political relations uh, at the global level and also at how you know at the country level um there is really much to reclaim in terms of economic sovereignty Okay, well, um, I wish Barbara would be with us now because actually um, she could jump in, I think, um, exactly on this private turn in development. You mentioned this very strong narrative um, that we need to maximize finance for development because there's just not enough resources to implement the SDGs. Um, and there are certain actors this narrative is coming from, and they're trying to see SDGs as investment opportunities and de-risk uh, um, all the investments. So um, if, I, I think I, I go, I jump because uh, there's not so much time left to the to the questions now, to the audience questions, if that's um, okay, because I, it seems Barbara is still not. Um, with us, I don't oh, I am, actually. Oh, you are? Okay, Barbara, so I maybe you Okay, I can hear you, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, so um, I think you probably were with us already when I said that you would be a very good uh, lecturer or speaker on, on this question of maximizing finance for development and this narrative and the private turn for development. So maybe you can uh, speak a little bit about this partnership thing uh, in my first question and then jump on to the later. I will do my best and please interrupt me because I've missed a, a fair bit of what we've all been discussing. So I might be overlapping or even be off track. Um, but very specifically in terms of partnerships, um, people sort of think of it as a very positive, inclusive approach. But in fact, in practice, if we look at how it's working out, it's not inclusive. It is basically something that the members of the partnership, the partners, are self-selected, first of all. Um, and they're usually only accountable to each other in the partnerships. And so that so many of the so-called beneficiaries are not even participating. Um, and in fact, are put into this category of beneficiaries so that there is no respect for agency and so on. It's basically um, quite, it's very patronizing in that sense in terms of how one actually approaches the problems that the partnerships are trying to address. The other thing about it is, and I'm going to go straight to some of the financing issues because of time. Um, while there are a whole variety of so-called benefits in partnerships, when you actually look at it, it is mainly about resource mobilization. And the articulation with the Sustainable Development Goals, for example, SDG 17, is on global partnerships. Now, if you actually take a look at the indicators that are being used to measure the success of partnerships, they're all to do with money. Uh, originally, when these indicators were being developed, it was basically to do with the amount of dollar commitments to public-private partnerships. And a number of us caused a lot of fuss um, about that and about the lack of accountability of some of the partners being accountable, for example, only to their own boards and not at all accountable to UN standards on human rights or SDGs, etc. Um, and uh, we had a little bit of success, but not the success that we hoped for, because what happened was that they divided the indicator for measuring the success of this goal into two parts. One is the percentage of total resources from contributions by donors, other than the top 15. And then we had part B, the percentage of total funding coming from private sector partners. And in that area, they differentiated civil society partnerships. So we had two. One was dollars committed to public-private partnerships, and part B was dollars committed to civil society partnerships. Um, and I think we all know that a large part of the commitment of civil society is to do with rights, is to do with agency, 
is to do with changing policies, is to do with fair and progressive taxation. And that, and it's not about just seeing civil society organisations as contributing finances. Um, and another comment that has become um, that is part of the discussion here, and why partnerships and private sector financing is said to be so important, is because the argument was always this is where the money is. The money is not in the public sector. Um, the money is in the private sector, and therefore we have to have the private sector involved. Now, on the one hand, you get this lovely contradiction where we are articulating that there are not enough resources in the public sector, which of course we know is not true. Um, they're just spent in ways that we wouldn't necessarily cheer for, like the military. Um, but also... Um, to actually incentivize or leverage, deliberately using the language, the private sector, we are using public sector resources, ODA, et cetera, to give incentives to the private sector to get involved. And not only that, because the returns on the market and interest rates are so poor at the moment, there are actually guarantees coming. So you get 1%, say, from the market. In some of these agreements, they're going to guarantee, say, 5%. Who's paying for that? If the concept is you're going to have enough growth to finance it, clearly that's not working. And then it's the taxpayer that has to provide the guaranteed underwriting of what is involved. So I suppose some of us are hoping that the lesson, that, the, that it's impossible to avoid the lesson from the pandemic that the public sector has to lead and that, that the public sector will generate resources because it has to. And that these partners are not all, if you like, equal in that regard. Uh, it's almost as if, and this I heard a little bit about the role of the state, it's almost as if the role of the state was not to guarantee governance and accountability for all people according to human rights, but just to basically manage engagement amongst the different sectors of society um, without a differential that some sectors of society have far more power and far more influence than other sectors of society. And we have this kind of concept of win-win, that everybody's going to gain if we can get everybody involved. The, the partnerships are lacking some serious conflict of interest criteria. And one of the things that we argue for is that the UN should not be engaging in a partnership with any corporation that doesn't pay taxes. Um, and so, and doesn't pay taxes preferably in the region where the, their wealth was generated. Um, I know there was a comment earlier about illicit financial flows, for example. So the other kind of very quick question, and please, I can't see what's happening, Elizabeth, so please interrupt me. Um, I'm... I'm sort of feeling a bit disconnected from all of you. Um, the other quick comment I wanted to make was this kind of direction is basically saying that market solutions are the orientation. And yet we know that for so much of what we are seeking in SDGs or elsewhere, the market solution, the short-termism is not going to take us where we need to go. It's not going to guarantee human rights. It's not going to provide the upfront long-term investment that is needed on the ecological front. And it also is very much relying on what we talk about as pro-cyclical funding, where what we really need is counter-cyclical funding in so many of these areas. So there are a number of reasons where while partnerships might be an important part of implementation, they should not be in design. And there needs to be criteria that we just don't have yet on eligibility criteria, on exclusion criteria, on expulsion 
criteria. Um, we need to have uh, criteria that they cannot change a program design, which should be decided multilaterally among states. They can contribute to its implementation. But the present pattern at the moment is programs are designed because money came forward, not the other way around. So I think that... Uh, that we have a lot of work to do to to stop and um, partnerships are it's almost as if they're becoming a principle and there are modality and there are modality sometimes they're not always we don't want public private partnerships to provide peacekeepers for example <laughs> Thanks so much, Barbara. I saw a lot of nodding, and um, I think uh, the two other speakers very much agree. Uh, these were already um, almost final words, um, but I quickly want to jump to the discussion because there were a lot of questions. Uh, try to cluster them. Um, I think one is, uh, I, I want to ask Jason, um, there was lots of questions around China, but basically, um, They, you can boil them down to what's the role of China as a donor or as a development partner and also as a creditor. Maybe you can go into a bit more detail on this. And, and then also, why is there no debt relief? I mean, what's the power structures in that regard? And why is there no international sovereign debt framework? Um, and maybe to, to Jennifer, uh, what do you think about um, micro credits? Um, If, if, you, if you could say a word on this. Um, and then on Barbara, uh, there's, there's a question on, on PPP. Um, that's okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go into that. Uh, maybe we start with the two questions uh, to Jason and Jennifer, and then I go to Barbara. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And um, I'll try and answer that by also building up on what Barbara has spoken about. Um, you know, talk about partnership and the unequal um, relationship and, and power relationships within um, within partnerships with responding specifically to things like the relationship between Africa and China, for example. It is purely extractivism. Um, you know the the Chinese model of, of engagement on the continent has has is very different. Um, the rigidity with which they apply principles. Uh, you know, Barbara mentioned things like exclusions, uh, rule, the rules for participation. What kinds of safeguarding mechanisms do you have in place? The Chinese have. Um, over the past 15 years in, in its involvement in, in, in Africa, not really implemented uh, and played along, you know, uh, along with those rules that have, have governed um, global um, ODA relations or global finance uh, relations at a bilateral level. The, the money and the resource, um, both human and financial, has come you know, at a relatively, in a relatively easy way. Um, and, and this has unfortunately uh, pandered to the, the soft spot of many leaders on the continent, not having to jump through so many loopholes uh, or, or hoops to actually uh, get the resources in. Um, but as we are seeing, the, the, the chickens are coming home to roost now because there is a huge challenge um, facing the continent with regard to its uh, debt volumes um, owed to China. And, and you know, the Chinese aggression with, with not necessarily wanting to sit down and, and restructure and um, discuss for debt relief. Um, they've also been very smart in their in the way they negotiated. So the collateralization of assets, national assets, as part of the financing arrangements, this is a huge challenge that many national governments are going to find very difficult to navigate uh, their way out of. Um, we're seeing this in, in many um, sub-Saharan African countries. But coming, sort of bringing it back to, to the issue of debt relief and, and the sovereign, a global sovereign uh, mechanism. So I, I think with the latter part, this, these do sort of exist um, in principle. So we do have, for example, the sovereign debt restructuring mechanism principles, the nine principles that were agreed some several years ago um, under UNCTAD and, and also at the, I think at the General Assembly of 2005, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the question is the extent to which, um, and in the spirit again of what Barbara was saying of, of partnerships, particularly within the UN, the spirit within which um, politically these 
these principles um, have been applied and have been allowed to work. Um, but secondly, we are in a new dispensation where the creditor landscape has changed immensely. And therefore, we do need to take a step back and ask ourselves whether the architecture, the global debt architecture, um, with regard to these principles still apply. Um, and do we need to update them? Do we need to make them more robust? And do we now need to, you know, seriously consider some sort of global authority or global framework for regulating um, how um, debt is being um, procured or, or accumulated by um, um, developing countries, um, you know, uh, generally speaking. Um, and debt relief, it, debt relief is there. there there's, you know, as a result of the pandemic, there have been several initiatives that have been um, put on, on, the, on the table for, for developing countries to seek. So, you know, there's the uh, debt suspension initiative by the IMF and the World Bank. There's the G20 uh, framework and, and a couple of others. And then there's bilateral, the Paris Club, for example, have also been engaged in, in looking at research structuring and relief as well. So there, there are these um, immediate relief measures that have been um, introduced and, and that are being used. But at the core of it, as Barbara said, we're not getting to the fundamental problems that are afflicting the global architecture. We're literally putting um, an elastoplast on, a, on, a, on, on, an an, on an artery that's bleeding profusely, and, and that's not going to hold. Um, so we need to figure that out. And then we need to also go back and look at the economic system that enables developing countries to generate their own domestic revenue mobilization through taxation. Um, so the issue of illicit financial flows, tax havens. Um, the aid architecture works within this and the commercialization of development is exactly what Barbara has talked about. You know, it does work within this aid architecture, and we need to find a way of reforming that. Thank you. These were brilliant uh, final words. If you if you are not very angry with me, I would also leave it at that and go to Jennifer and Barbara because we only have seven minutes left. Um, Jennifer, there was one question uh i think that that would be very good for you for you to answer um how should ngos in the north actually then transform their ways of operating um if they operate with these kind of problematic development models so far um is there something you would imagine for the future in that regard and then for barbara the the final question would be um People agree very much with this program money logic that you mentioned. Um, how could we actually change that in a practical way and find a way out? Jennifer first. All right. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that. So um, just uh, a little bit about the earlier question about microcredits. I, I'm not really uh, well-versed on it, but I think... Um, Strengthening domestic industries really includes ensuring that um, uh, the, the, the local, uh, especially the MSMEs, have access to capital. So I think uh, in that way, um, um, we are uh, uh, supporting their, the, the national, uh, the nation building you know, of, the, of developing countries. But to your question about um, what the, the, the northern um, CSOs could do differently. Um, I would think that um, let's start from the question of um, for whom are we doing our development work, whether we are working in the context of the global north in solidarity with the south, or for those of us, like um, even international, who are working in uh, many southern countries. Um, so the question of for whom is really important, and so it, we must be very clear that all our work is for the people and that we are working towards their substantive participation um, in, in, in various uh, uh, policy arenas as well as in, in um, you know, um, uh, plotting development paths of, of, of uh, uh, the country or um, of uh, communities. You know. And so with this, it is very important that um, there is a recognition that um, the provision of an enabling environment for CSOs um, 
is is uh, a key ingredient. And so um, I would like to also bring out the the need for solidarity for um, CSOs, people's organizations working in the South, who are um, in many cases are um, experiencing this enabling uh, environment and are actually being um, attacked. Um, there are many ways of um, of um, providing support for for um, developing country CSOs, um, and this includes ensuring that um, you know we provide them with um, affirmative action, um, ensuring that they have a voice in in different um, arenas, and also. Um, that we uh, expose the the many challenges that they are facing um, from the uh, hands of the state themselves. So this includes, you know, the the human rights violations that many communities experience, especially the indigenous peoples, um, the rural folks. Um, who are um, impacted by development aggression and who are um, daily experiencing repression and um, including uh, killings, you know, um, and that is uh, an experience that is painfully <laughs> um, real in the Philippines. Thanks so much, uh, Barbara. Can I? Can I hand over to you um, as a final, you'll have the final words. Uh, and if you go, okay. into, yeah. So how do we change yes. the program yes. money logic? <laughs> yes, um, I think the first thing we have to recognize is that not all money and resources actually support human rights and sustainability. So we have to say no sometimes. Uh, and I think that everybody finds that very difficult. Uh, I think we have to recognize that we're not short of money, particularly, and money isn't the solution to everything, but we're just the quality and the way we use it. So we need much more scrutiny with regard to that. So something in that direction using the UN. I think we have to say absolutely no to any special project funding until the basic core business has been funded. And that no government, it's not only private sector that's doing this, can do what in the UN language is called earmarking, can actually earmark their contribution to something particular until they already have a track record, let's say three years, of contributing to the core budget to at least 50%, say, of a development agency or the UN, and that they're not eligible for this kind of special project funding, and nor are the corporate contributors in that regard, and that there has to be a substantial levy or contribution from the corporate world to the general functioning of what the UN is about before they can actually get into this kind of funding. Um, I wanted, for those who want to look more at some of what can go really wrong with PPPs, there's um, the whole education. A PPP to build a school is something completely different from a PPP that runs the education day in, day out. And there are some very good chapters in the Spotlight Report, uh, Elizabeth, that you've mentioned that actually get into analyzing that. Uh, my last comment is, that I think actually we can do something with ODA to turn it to good. Um, the UN is adopted uh, and have all member states a long time ago, a few years ago, something called the Universal Social Protection Floor, which is a way of having the essential public services that, that are absolutely vital. They're vital for women in the care economy. They are vital for health. They're vital for education. They're vital for water. And I think that all of the resources that are channeling through ODA, instead of picking and choosing your pet project or what you want to do, have to come into a, a pooled fund to actually ensure 
social universal social protection floor, particularly for those countries at the moment that need it and don't have or can't keep the resources because of the rules of the game that they generate. And I think that should be the absolute first priority for ODA. And I think that there needs to be uh, an independent oversight body, group, whatever, um, that has on it representatives from different sectors of society that basically are providing some scrutiny on how this multilateral funding track would act, what it would actually be funding. So I think we need to, we don't need to just say stop it all, we need to completely change how it's used. And it has to be held accountable to the decisions that the member states are making collectively for the good of everybody, particularly the those that are um, the most disadvantaged, if you like, or pushed out, not just disadvantaged. They're literally rejected by the current functioning of the models, the economic, the social, the political models that we currently have. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you uh, to all the three of you and um, of course to the, the organizers. I have a lot more questions now than I had um, before we started discussing and I would love to continue the discussion. Um, please find in the chat the, the web pages of, um, of the work our spe speakers do. Um, I think uh, it's very interesting to follow up and I'm sure that we all need to closely monitor the, the frameworks uh, we spoke about, uh, especially now that the post-COVID area is uh, being talked about. And uh, let me finish with thanking the organizers. Uh, I think they cut us short now. <laughs> um, thanks to the organizers, thanks to Medico, and thanks to the translators. And uh, goodbye and talk to you soon, I hope. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Stay well, stay Thank you safe. So bad. Stay safe and well. It's